centuries, the great north woods of Canada and Alaska was a remote wilderness where only trappers, hunters, and native peoples dared go. Trekking through it was exhausting. Flying over it was dangerous. Going around it was impossible. But that all changed. For the last 50 years, we've been able to drive it. it from up here, but that tiny ribbon of road slicing through the wilderness is one of America's awesome untold stories. It's really a war story. Incredible hardships, human challenge, victories on the ground. But the story begins south of here, as the United States, in the middle of the Depression, heard the rumblings of a new peril, a deadlier peril. At first, it was odd and ominous speeches interrupting Fibber McGee and Molly and Tommy Dorsey or Jack Benny. Then the German Army and Air Force conquered Poland. Japan continued its overthrow and occupation of China. War was declared. Paris was captured. London was burning. The Japanese Imperial Army seemed unstoppable. And warfare had a terrible new tactic, murderous assault from the skies. With military aircraft more and more dominant, could the ocean still protect us from attack? In December of 1941, America had a new nightmare, the fear of invasion. Because of air power, our physical isolation from world conflict was over forever. In the North Woods, the war seemed far away. Here, if the quiet of the forest was interrupted by the sound of a plane coming in low, it meant a bush pilot with supplies and mail, bringing life, not death, from the skies. But in the spring of 1942, World War II came to Alaska and Northern Canada, so thousands of Americans came north to start protecting our northern flank because the Japanese, with air power, could have established footholds in this part of the world and then attacked the continental United States and perhaps invaded. So because of the threat of Japanese air power and to supply our defenders in the north, America created a 1,600 mile long, 24 foot wide lifeline, the Alaska Highway. The job facing the United States Army Corps of Engineers would cost millions of dollars. It meant loading, and transporting, unloading, and deploying thousands of tons of equipment and 10,000 soldiers throughout a vast and largely unexplored wilderness. This peaceful, ageless land would never be the same. And they knew the job had to be done quickly. The enemy might come. But the brutal winter of the North Woods was on its way for sure. By the time winter arrived, less than nine months later, against unbelievable odds, that highway had to exist. This is a typical stretch of the Alaska Highway. Hi, I'm David Hartman. Highways are usually described by how long it takes to get to something they're near, like we're 20 minutes from Des Moines. But for most of it, 1,600 miles, the only thing the Alaska Highway is near is the Alaska Highway. You know, back in 1942, a soldier described this road as being miles and miles of miles and miles. And he was right. He still is right. Nonetheless, thousands of people drive this road every year, maybe uh, just to prove that they can face those miles and miles. The highway is famous for spectacular mountain ranges, but it's not all craggy peaks and virgin forests. It starts, or ends, depending on which way you're going, in the rolling farmland around Dawson Creek, British Columbia, past bogs filled with stuff called muskeg. It's like quicksand. 
over hundreds of streams and rivers. But those natural wonders that we enjoy today are what made building the road seem impossible. Why it was so long between the idea of this highway and the reality of it. Bulldozers meet trees, repeat the process 10,000 times or more, follow up with grading, digging, and tons of gravel, and that should do it. But where do the bulldozers come from? The nearest bulldozers were a thousand miles away, along with the fuel and the men to run them. And which trees? There were millions of trees, mostly leading toward impassable mountain ranges, swamps, and rivers. The story of the building of the Alaska Highway is a lot more than just bulldozers and trees. It's a story that begins with a question, not how can we do this, but why should we do this? For years, this is what the average American thought Alaska was like, a worthless, Russian-owned wasteland. Few Americans shared the strategic vision of William Seward, our Secretary of State. So it's easy to understand the amazement in 1867 when America bought Alaska. To most people, $7.2 million seemed a lot to pay for this. 30 years later, buying Alaska looked even smarter. Gold was discovered in Canada's Yukon Territory, and the American port city of Skagway in the Alaska Panhandle was how to get there. The 40,000 prospectors who went north didn't have a land route across Canada, so they went by ship up the Inland Passage from Seattle. A road had been considered, though, and explored. In 1897, the Canadian government sent J.D. Moody, a Northwest Mounted Policeman, to find a land route across Western Canada, an alternative to the Skagway route. After more than a full year of trudging through total wilderness trying to reach the Yukon gold fields, Inspector Moody wired his superiors a recommendation about the overland route that really meant take the boat. 35 years later, Slim Williams passed Skagway as he drove his dog team down the coast from Alaska to Seattle and then turned east and made it to the Chicago World's Fair. Slim proved the coastal route was at least feasible, first by dog and then seven years later by hog. Many possible overland routes to Alaska were hotly debated for decades. There was one up the Rocky Mountain Trench the Canadians liked. There was the prairie route that was popular with the Plains states. But then, that Sunday morning at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese high command ended the debate forever. The attack on Pearl Harbor provoked an emotional response in the American people unlike anything since the Civil War. Part of that response was fear, that nightmare of possible attack and invasion. If Pearl Harbor today, Westerners thought, then perhaps Los Angeles, or San Francisco, Seattle, and Vancouver tomorrow. Japanese submarines were spotted on the California coast. One of them shelled Santa Barbara. Rumors and fears spread. Because of those fears, President Roosevelt quickly re-examined an overland route to Alaska. But why Alaska, when the enemy had just attacked Hawaii? Because the Japanese had pulled off a sneak attack over 4,000 miles of ocean by air. Physical boundaries, oceans, mountains, trenches had become meaningless in warfare. The shortest distance between two points was all that mattered, and that created new centers of strategic power, like Alaska. General Billy Mitchell understood. Testifying before Congress in 1935, Mitchell said, Alaska is the most central place in the world for aircraft. He who controls Alaska will control the world. In other words, Alaska is closer than anywhere to everywhere if you're a flyer. America ignored Mitchell. The Japanese didn't. Even before the war, they protested that an overland road to Alaska would be considered an aggressive military act against Japan. After Pearl Harbor, aggressive military acts against Japan were just what America wanted to do, but wasn't yet able to do. We could build that highway, though, and now we had a powerful reason to do it, and a powerful argument for where to do it, and we had the people to do it, too, like Corps of Engineers Surveyor Al Eschbach. Of course, for years, I think, even in 1936, there was a commission appointed to select a coastal route. However, the effect of Pearl Harbor 
put that pretty much in jeopardy because there's no way we could then protect the road from a Japanese attack from the Western Pacific. But a protectable inland passage removed from Japanese attack already existed. It was called the Northwest Staging Route, a series of eight airfields in places like Toke and Watson Lake. With the war on and thousands of Lend-Lease aircraft being flown across Canada and Alaska to the Soviet Union, those airfields needed to be supplied regularly, and that meant over land. So for military reasons, the Alaska-Canada Highway, called the Alcan, would not connect the cities of the West Coast to Alaska. It would start in the Canadian Midwest and stay well inland. Colonel Heath Twitchell of the 35th Engineers writing home to his wife. Dear Francis, you may have seen a lot in the papers about the route, criticizing the reasons for its selection, claiming that it's impossible. We have no such misgivings. All we want is to be left alone to do the job. Uh, it was a very, a very mixed reaction in Canada. There was objection on, on the grounds of national pride and sovereignty. The Americans just planned to build this road, dispatched the first units up here, issued all the orders to get the material moving without even getting the approval of the Canadian government. That came later. Heath Twitchell, Jr., son of the colonel and author of Northwest Epic, based on his father's memoirs. How great was the pressure to get the road started and why? The pressure was enormous, it really was. The construction season in this part of the world is about six months long, from late May, early June until October. After that, it gets so cold, the ground gets so hard, it's not workable. A bulldozer blade will not turn earth in this part of the world in January. Describe the weather. What was it like? Awful. In 1942, they started with the coldest winter in 70 years, first of all. Uh, it, it was just bitter cold. Temperatures as low as 70 degrees below zero were recorded along the highway the year of, the year of construction. And those troops had their GI issue winter clothing, but uh, most of them had never received instruction on how to use it, uh, had never faced temperatures like this. Uh, they had frostbite problems, they had morale problems. People would uh, warm their hands in front of a fire and get so dizzy they'd faint uh, from the change in temperature. Uh, it was tough. The Alaska Highway, the 1943 Hollywood version. I want to fight the Japs, all right. But building a highway is not my kind of fight. You got it all wrong, Woody. This is important. Yeah, yeah, I know. I want to sling lead at the Japs, not mud. But for 10,000 guys like Woody, slinging lead would have to wait. On February 14, 1942, the War Department instructed the Corps of Engineers to begin construction immediately and America went into action. Every year on the Alaska Highway, thousands of tourists and truckers go north to Alaska or south to the Yukon and British Columbia in relative ease. I got some old buddies here that, uh, that ran it in the oh, late 40s, early 50s, and it was, a, it was a run then. It was a, a run to hell. That's what they used to call it. <laughs> Describe what this trip has been like on the Alaska Highway on a bike. It's been incredible. Why? How? It's just that you're sitting out in the open and there's nothing to obstruct your vision. And some of these hills that you come up over are mountains and it just opens up. You just don't know what you're going to see. We drove up here first time in 1984. You saw nobody. But what do you like? You wouldn't keep coming back and driving this if you didn't like it. What do you like about it? I'm a nut. <laughs> when the highway was built, nothing about it was easy. There's a challenge that comes with building a road in the wilderness that you just don't have when you build, say, an apartment house, and that is just getting to the work site. So in the spring of 1942, uh, the first big job of the Corps of Engineers was to move 10,000 men and thousands of tons of heavy equipment up north fast. Reporting to Colonel Twitchell was Paul Symbol. And our mission was to get a pioneer road so that you could travel with a truck to get supplies up to Fairbanks. And we had no instructions, none whatsoever. It was up to us to decide the width of the road, the number of curves, and what steep grades were. And that, our job was just to do that, to get through. 
These first troops moved out over a trail to Fort Nelson and began working northwest. Other regiments entered the Yukon through Skagway and established a base camp at Whitehorse. They began working both northwest and southeast. Still other regiments entered Alaska at Valdez and moved up to the interior. From here, they began toward Fairbanks and the Yukon border. Many of the men thought they were going to the South Pacific to build airfields and learn the hula. One soldier wrote home that when destination Dawson Creek, British Columbia was stenciled on his train, there was stunned silence. Then the booing started. Nehemiah Atkinson. This was a military secret. You didn't know where you were going until you got on the ship. When we got on the ship at Port Louis, Washington, Seattle, then they said, you're headed to Alaska. And your first stop will be Valdez, Alaska. What was your reaction when you heard that? I said, wow, we'll never get back home again. In Dawson Creek, an arriving soldier reported, the dogs here outnumber the humans and showed a greater interest in our arrival. The day we landed in Whitehorse, it was quite cold, and we got off the train in mud, and we got a real surprise. They marched us up the street, up Main Street toward the bluffs for about two miles until we got to the top of the bluffs. And then we set up a camp up there, and it was slushy and muddy. We were rather jubilant because we'd gotten off the train and new adventure, you know, and uh, we weren't aware of what was coming, and it came. I think we had been on the ground three or four days when the storm came in and dropped three inches of snow. Watching on this white horse street the day John Paxton arrived was Goody Sparling. For her, life had instantly become a lot more interesting. And of course, it was an exciting time for us living here to have all these young men around, and especially in my age group, because we'd never seen so many young men around, and they were very exciting, and it was an exciting time for all of us. When we arrived at Dawson Creek, the supplies were there that we needed to start the road, and there was no bridge across the Peace River, and that Peace River was a real wide river, but lucky it was frozen. Well, at the railhead, it was quite hectic because we knew the thaw was coming and everybody was in a hurry trying to decide the priority to which to move in case the thaw came sooner. And Colonel Twitchell really put the pressure on us to get that s equipment supplies up there. We had to get those bulldozers up to Fort Nelson. That was the most important thing. Then we had to get the fuel, the diesel fuel, to run them. Then we had to get the gasoline. Then we had to get our trucks up there. We had to get the food. We had to get the tents. We had to get all up there at Fort Nelson before the thaw hit the Peace River and the Muskeg. And luckily, we succeeded. While Paul Symbol worked on deploying men and supplies inland around Fort Nelson, Marvin Taylor had the same cargoes, but some different problems on the coast. Well, Skagway was our home port, and we was very efficient operation. We loaded the rail cars up with all kinds of cargo and supplies, and fire them off to Whitehorse. We couldn't get the empties returned, and when we got to Whitehorse, uh, it was obvious what the bottleneck was. It was cars sitting everywhere with cargo on them, and the contractors and suppliers were only coming and get their goods when they needed it. So we just went up and down the railroad track, set the material off on the ground, and fired the cars back to Skagway. Most Canadians, including First Nations people like Pearl Keenan, uh, were completely surprised by the Americans' arrival. I was just a young girl then, and I was coming along about, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Dogs were running up along the shore, and all of a sudden they took off into the bush, just uh, going. And I yelled and hollered at them to come back here. And all of a sudden they took off, they never listened to me, just boom, away the they went. All of a sudden, my God, I heard somebody yelling up there. Hey, 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 hey. Holy smoke, it's a, that's unusual. And the dogs turned right around and came right back to me. As soon as they heard my voice, they just came right back. And I thought, what? That's funny. Because there's nobody, uh, there was only three people here, at, or four people here at Tesla. And then I went down to the post office in the store. He says, there's a... Uh, they're building a highway all the way from uh, Dawson Creek to Fairbanks. And I can remember looking up the hill, and it was dark, and seeing these lights coming over into 
right into the wilderness, you know, just over the mountains, like over the hill. Just marveled at it. Just really fantastic to see something like that. Some troops had it worse than others. No troops had it as bad as the some 3,500 African Americans. In 1942, the armed forces were still segregated. The black troops were given the worst jobs in the worst places with the worst equipment, and that certainly didn't change when they came up here. Uh, they weren't allowed to come into Whitehorse or any other populated area, and this was all thanks to the commander of the Alaskan Defense. He was General Simon Bolivar Buckner, and this is what he wrote. Dear General Sturdivant, the high wages offered to unskilled labor here would attract a large number of Negroes to settle after the war, interbreeding with Indians and Eskimos, producing an astonishingly objectionable race of mongrels. There was no such thing as self-respect then. You were a soldier, and you either did or you got court-martialed. And every soldier there didn't want to be court-martialed. Hayward Obrey. And if you read about what happened during those times, they said, keep them away because we don't want integration with the Eskimos or with the Indians or anybody. And so we were kept into the wilderness, and that's where it was to get that highway through. Many of the new arrivals, black and white, knew what to do and how to do it, but not where. We knew nothing about this area. Uh, all we knew is we had to get across it. Our knowledge was as blank as this part of the map. And their instructions simply were, we'll proceed in a northwesterly direction. And that's pretty sensible, because if you stay in a northwesterly direction, you'll re eventually reach Fairbanks. But the fact that there's a couple of mountain ranges in between, uh, they had no concept of, because they didn't have good maps either. Roads took the place of wagon paths, which took the place of horse trails, which took the place of walking paths, which took the place of animal tracks. So the precise location of many highways was determined centuries before the bulldozers arrived. The Alaska Highway was different. As one local guide put it, when an Army surveyor asked him how to get somewhere, don't know, nobody ever go that way. So they put the Alaska Highway where even the elk and moose don't go. Fortunately, experienced bush pilots were there to help Army surveyors find the best route. Heath, what's this airplane and how significant was this kind of plane in this whole process? David, this is a bush plane, and it's very important to the story of the Alaska Highway. This is the mainstay of the transportation system and network in Yukon and Alaska in the 1920s and 30s. If you wanted to get anywhere, particularly with anything heavy, you put it in an airplane and you moved it, people and goods. And when the Army engineers came in in 1942, they had people and goods to move around, and they also needed pilots who knew the terrain, knew the routes, knew the possibilities, because they didn't have a map that showed them where that highway was going to go. The bulldozers and the guys are on the ground, clearing trees and working. Where were the airplanes at that point, and how far away were they? Well, the bush pilots would be up in the air, maybe five to 50 miles ahead of the bulldozers, and the surveyors would be out anywhere from 100 yards to five miles. So they built this road a few miles at a time, and sometimes only days ahead of the, of the bulldozers was the decision made as to where it was going to go. Flying did help to get a general sense of the route. But eventually, the surveyors needed a closer look. And for that, the Army could not have managed without First Nations people, the Clinkets, the Athabascans, and other indigenous peoples of the North Country, like the legendary Charlie McDonald. There's no way to describe how valuable he was to us. So Charlie said, look, I'll show you a different route. And that is what this film is about. Al Eshbox, Home Movies. We're just starting out now, and you see me leaving, and that's the last I saw of the camp for some 30 days. And here we are at famous Muncho Lake. This is the point where we could go no further. And so Charlie said, look, I'll show you a different route. We are coming through a mountain meadow here with an ideal road location site but in the distance, you can see the rockings that we will eventually work our way around. We arrived at Lower Post, British Columbia. Uh, I, coming east, met my other men coming west, which meant we had found a buildable route from Fort St. John to Watson Lake. 
By the late spring of 42, highway work was going on at an acceptable pace. Then in June, the people who really motivated this whole project gave the Corps of Engineers another huge kick in the pants. June 3rd, airplanes from Japan attack the town of Dutch Harbor in the Aleutian Islands. More than 75 are killed. June 16th, Japan occupies the islands of Atu and Kiska. The Japanese are off the ground in Alaska. Is an invasion of the United States coming? Will the Alcan Highway be completed in time to stop it? The war dominated America's attention in 1942. Bataan fell in April, Corregidor in the Philippines in May. But at last, there was good news, too. The day after the Japanese attacked Dutch Harbor in Alaska, carrier-based American planes crushed the Japanese fleet at the Battle of Midway. It was the first naval battle in history where the opposing ships never saw each other, fighting entirely by air. It was a stunning demonstration of air power and the importance of having your planes in the right place at the right time. The Japanese didn't attack the Aleutians because they wanted the territory. The attacks were unsuccessful diversions for Midway to draw away American forces. American commanders weren't fooled, but American engineers got hopping. Well, you won't be needing me now that you're getting all these new men. Read it. Japanese forces have occupied Aleutian Islands, Kiska, Atu, and Agatu. Crisis demands redoubled efforts in opening a highway before scheduled time. Certainly pouring it on, aren't they? We attempted to uh, stay to at least a full day's walk, maybe 20 miles ahead of the bulldozers clearing. There was a rule that if we were laying down at night sleeping and we heard the bulldozers, we had to get up and get to work because that meant they were close enough to where we had to get some more road located for them. And what were the men following 25 miles behind Al Eschbach doing? Colonel Heath Twitchell wrote to his family. My dears, I thought it might be interesting to take you on a trip over the road. Ten of the biggest caterpillar tractors made are knocking down and clearing out trees. It's a terrific sight to see them crashing through the woods, pushing over trees up to 16 inches in diameter like matchsticks. Behind them come more large caterpillars, grading the road to a rough final shape with various kinds of equipment. Then come a flock of smaller caterpillars, putting the final shape on the road. Then the working parties, doing hand finishing, putting in bridges and culverts. It is a job to test to the full both our men and our equipment. We have no fear that we shall be found wanting. Love, Heath. One of the things my dad was proudest of was his time with the 35th engineers here on the Alaska Highway. And this scene at Muncho Lake is typical of the can-do spirit that he talked a lot about. When they got here in the spring of 1942, that cliff came straight down to the water with no place for a roadbed. When they got ready to do the blasting, what they had to do was find caves along the base of the cliff here, and that had to be done from underwater. The first person to do this was an officer named Mike Militich, and what he did was he took off all his clothes, they tied a rope around his waist so he could dive off the cliff in case anything happened to him, they could fish him out. He found a depression underneath the water line big enough to hold a box of, a box of TNT, he took the box, put it in there, a minute later, enormous explosion, tons of rock into the water forming the beginnings of a roadbed. They repeated that process down the length of the shoreline for a mile, and by the end of the summer, the engineers had a road along Muncho Lake. The Japanese weren't the enemy up here. The enemy was really something uh, more common. It was water, water uh, moving too slowly or too fast, uh, water freezing when you wanted it wet, ice melting when you wanted it hard. Maybe worst of all was water going into the ground and turning into nothing helpful, like mud. Colonel Twitchell drove his Jeep nine miles one time and his odometer read 13 miles. His wheels had slipped four miles worth of revolution. Then there's permafrost, where you dig down just a little way and you hit ground that's been frozen solid since the Ice Age. 
first, they tried scraping the topsoil off and putting the road right on the permafrost. But removing the topsoil allowed the permafrost to melt, so quickly it became mud, as slippery and gooey as axo grease. But the worst was muskeg. Someone from the southern part of this hemisphere would say that it's a swamp. But the difference is that it is a frozen swamp, and it's a series of layers of ice and moss and ice and moss. The uh, danger of muskeg is once you open it up, it is practically bottomless from the point of view of construction. They discovered that the solution to muskeg and permafrost was to build over it, not through it. Or better yet, build around it. And that's why the Pioneer Road was so crooked, not to make it hard for enemy planes to strafe convoys, but to avoid muskeg and permafrost. And also because the Corps of Engineers knew that 6,000 civilian road workers were coming along right behind the soldiers, turning that Pioneer Road into something straighter and smoother, something actually drivable. Men like bridge designer James Kwong. The road was not a road, it was a trail. In most cases, it required uh, straightening, you know, bypassing all the curves and so on. The original bridges that were built by the army were essentially uh, just a means of getting across until something better is built. There was a, a program to rebuild uh, some of the bridges. The first so-called permanent, in fact, it was a semi-permanent bridge across the Sikhani Canyon was opened uh, in early 1943. But the timber trestle bridge it replaced was famous not for how or where it was built, but by whom. The 95th Engineers were a black engineer regiment, professionally trained, highly trained, and they had all their equipment with them when they came to the Alaska Highway Project. And yet in the first weeks of the project, they had their bulldozers and their dump trucks taken away from them, left with their shovels and their wheelbarrows to do finishing work behind the white engineer regiment that was ahead of them on the highway. That created a tremendous morale problem for those black soldiers who knew they could do better. My dad took command of the regiment in July of 1942, and he persuaded General O'Connor, the general in charge of the southern half of the highway, that what his outfit needed was a morale building exercise, and the Sikhany Chief River Bridge was to be that exercise. And in three short days, they built a bridge across this 300-foot stream. It was a solidly built bridge, and it was built much to the surprise of the superiors, but to the satisfaction of the men who built it. Of all the bridges on the Alaska Highway, this one here was the last one to give way to Mother Nature. My father was a man of his time. He'd never known many black people, and he'd never worked with black soldiers. But it's clear from his letters home, he learned to trust them, and they learned to trust him. And I've always been proud of him for that. <laughs> Fighting men in the Canadian Northwoods are facing a new challenge today, a mysterious swamp fever unknown to science. But Army doctors have the situation well in hand. The glory road to Tokyo marches on at a breakneck pace. He was right about the pace, but mysterious swamp disease was something a reporter made up. The reality was busted and bruised men who still had to go to work in awful, sometimes lethal conditions. Nehemiah Atkinson. The toughest member was to lose Nelson, the soldier. That was a tough member. The fuel pump froze up, the gas lines froze up. We found them about three days later, frozen to death. We had to really dig him from under the snow because that whistling wind had banked up. And uh, we found them and brought him to the medical detachment dispenser, which I ran thawed him out, and buried him in Ladfield, Fairbanks, Alaska. Some soldiers found unique ways to do their duty and still keep warm. When a unit complained they were late for roll call because they couldn't hear the bugle, the commanding officer investigated. The cold was inescapable. It didn't honor rank or race, and that led to a day Hayward Obrey would always remember. The commander of all of us called us one day to an open field. He said, there are no ranks here today. He said, the outfit that's across the river refuses to give us our uh, supplies. He said, there are trees around. 
You say, forget what you are as a commissioned officer. Choose a partner and go and drag logs and pile them up as high as you can. Because if we don't, we'll all freeze in this cold weather. That's an experience where the segregation had to be dropped because of the climatic conditions. After the cold, there was the midnight sun. Endless daylight can eventually drive you nuts. Psychologists call it terminal seasonal affective disorder. Locals call it getting bushed. The depressing conditions were partially responsible for one of the few murders among the workers. A soldier was being kidded by his buddies one night and vowed to shoot the next man who entered the tent. They thought he was joking, but he did it. The biggest problem day in, day out in the summer may have been the fact that, as one person said, any place you went, something wanted to eat you. Not uh, bears, not wolves, but bugs. Billions of the nastiest blood-sucking insects on the planet. To protect themselves, sometimes the men wore hats like these. They uh, didn't do much good, though. Bugs got through anyway. Guys like these. Um, you know, bees, of course, the yellow jacket, they can get you. Wasps, one of the good guys, dragonfly. Here's another bee. There's a moth here, they don't do anything to you at all. Just millions of these mosquitoes. These are not just tiny little mosquitoes. They have some real girth to them and they sting. But the worst are the black flies. They do not sting, they bite, they draw blood, and they can leave welts for days or weeks. So basically, in winter, it's lethally cold. Uh, then it thaws, and the ground turns to deep, sucking gumbo mud. Then it warms up, and the mud becomes choking dust, and the mosquitoes and black flies arrive for lunch. Uh, then it gets hot and rains, and the dust becomes mud again, and then there's more cold. And there's always a chance of a forest fire or a hungry bear, obstinate moose, other friends of the forest. You know, it's no wonder that the soldiers who built this road used to say if the Japanese conquer this place, it'd serve them right. To make matters worse, the civilian workers of the American Public Roads Administration were treated better than the GIs because they could leave if they weren't treated well. Deprivation's always harder to endure when you can see the alternative. As soon as they began to let private contractors move in there, they had to meet union requirements which meant formal mess halls, uh, waitresses, and the last I heard as I left, they were actually even getting grapefruit. And unlike the soldiers, the civilians were warned of the conditions before they went. Contractors used this ad to recruit civilian workers. It's one of the more remarkable examples of honesty in advertising history. Living up here can be lonely, even though solitude is one of the attractions of the wilderness. This attraction is the Watson Lake Signpost Forest, and loneliness actually started it. Uh, back in 1942, a lonely GI put up a sign pointed toward his hometown, Danville, Illinois. Uh, since then, passers-by have been adding their own towns, so now the Signpost Forest has more than 25,000 possible destinations and they all point toward home for somebody. For those who were already home, especially the First Nations people, life had changed forever. Linda McDonald, niece of trailblazer Charlie McDonald. It, it changed people's economy because then, of course, you, you weren't just trapping. It, it meant that you were cutting wood, um, you were laboring on the road. And then when the Indian agent said, well, I think your kids have to be in school, a lot of people moved to Whitehorse and, and Lower Post because they, they wanted to be closer to their kids, uh, although they were taken away anyway. Even the people who lived right there, they weren't allowed to be with their kids. Things were easier for travel, but uh, overall, life definitely, definitely changed as, as a result of the highway. We never had a doctor here. We never had a nurse here because we never, ever got sick. I guess there was a lot of people that did get sick and stuff like that, but there were so few deaths and everything, you know. But after the highway came through, it was that uh, 1942. 
that fall. There was measles, yellow jaundice, and you name it, that disease was here, really and truly. But they never let the army doctors come in because they were, we were civilians. Although they were pushing through our country and doing everything like that, but we couldn't get their help from them, army doctors or anything like that. And it was, it is pretty rough, really, truly rough. We lost a lot of our people, a lot of our people that way. For the men working on the Alaska Highway, the approaching invader wasn't the Japanese army. It was winter, and their fight was to create eight miles of highway a day, every day, before cold made that impossible. Dear friends, it's going to be a fight now against the shortening days and the worsening weather, against failing equipment and tiring men. But knowing the spirit of all our men, white and colored, I know that the victory will be won, and that what seemed like a hopeless task at the beginning will be a concrete reality soon. Love, Heath. When your dad wrote that letter, what shape was the road at that point? Well, it was pretty close to being finished, David. That was uh, late September, early October of 1942. They knew they were going to make it before winter set in. They knew it was going to be a road that they could use. But the real story is the story of the, the race to the Canadian border between the 18th Engineers, which is building the road right here along Soldier Summit, and the 97th Engineers, a black outfit that nobody thought much of at all. They started from about the same distance back, about 75 miles. And these uh, soldiers of the 18th, even to this day, won't admit that they got beat. But the 97th made it to the border and 20 miles inside Canada before the two bulldozers linked up and the black soldiers won the race. The Southern Gap, that last gap between Dawson Creek and Fairbanks, was closed about the same time, and it wasn't anything like the movies. Hey, soldier, where are you headed for? Me, I'm headed down. Down? Yeah, how come you're headed north? Hey, this is it. Hey, Gary, come here. Steve, Jordy. Well, what's, what's the matter with you? What's 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 He's headed south, we're headed north. It's open, the Elkin Highway. Ah! It really wasn't all exciting, really. We knew they were coming because we had contact each other on foot. And uh, we knew they were coming. You could hear the bulldozers from both sides coming towards one another, going faster and faster, wanting to touch blades. And that's just what they did. And they, they met at Contact Creek. And two bulldozer blades touched one another, and that was it. The official opening ceremonies for the Alaska Highway were held at Soldier's Summit by Kluwani Lake, 160 miles west of Whitehorse. Here we are in Soldier Summit today. What was it like that November day in 1942? November 20th, 1942, David, it was cold. How cold? 30 degrees below zero, light snowfall. Sun came up over the mountains over here about 10 o'clock in the morning. There were a couple of bonfires up on the hill and some warming tents. Of course, when they had the ceremony, everybody had to leave the bonfire. There were dignitaries from Alaska, from Canada, and all the military brass. They stopped the ceremony in the middle because the Mounties were literally freezing to death. They, they went in and got their bear coats and put them on and came back out. Continued the ceremony. When the speeches were all done, they cut the ribbon with a gold-plated pair of scissors, flags flying, bands playing the national anthem. And from up the road here, there was a convoy of trucks with the engines running. The lead truck had a sign on it. The first truck to Fairbanks came rolling through. Everybody cheered, clapped as the convoy disappeared in the distance. Everybody ran for the other trucks to get back to where it was warm. How great an achievement was their building the road? Imagine the United States before all of this infrastructure was uh, in place, and you were going to build a gravel road from New York to Denver, cross country, across mountains and rivers and forests, and do it in 10 months. That's what this road represents. I hope that in years to come, some tourist will offer up some little thanks to all the humble men who brought him here. It is gratifying to know that our road will need very little change to be incorporated into the final route, being a great deal better than anyone thought it would be. When the road was finished and the ceremony was over and the trucks were rolling, and this highway really wasn't in all that great shape, but as far as the Army was concerned, their mission was accomplished. They'd opened a road from Dawson Creek to Fairbanks. You could drive it. Anything in the way of improvements, widening and straightening and so forth, that was the responsibility of the American Public Roads Administration, and that would happen in the next year. The Army marched away, declared victory, let the civilians clean up the mess. Jack Edwards, civilian road builder. And they went down creeks and 
They went through marshes and did things that people building a highway wouldn't do. The winter, when the winter came, the road that they put in worked fine because uh, it froze and it was hard and you know, it was like concrete. But spring came, <laughs> and we used to call it the, the Alcan Canal because it, it turned into a like a bog, a lot of them, quagmire, and there were trucks stuck here, and they were hauling them out all the time. They wanted to get through and fast and run equipment over it. And we wanted to build a road that you could last for a long time and that you could have regular traffic on and would stand up. The Alaska Highway has never really been finished. The road crews are constantly straightening and regrading, repairing frost heaves and other damage. From heavy traffic and extreme temperature changes, this road takes a terrific beating. Critics have had a field day with both the Army and the highway uh, ever since 1942. In fact, recently, some 50 years after completion of the road, a Canadian writer was still complaining about American occupation of Canada and how the road was expensive and wasteful and damaged people and animals in the land. All of which is true, of course, to a degree, like with all roads. But some claim the road was just not necessary. Was it? The month the Alaska Highway was finished, we were fighting the Japanese in the Solomon Islands near Guadalcanal and in the seas around New Guinea. It didn't take generals or admirals to realize that the theater of war was in the south, not north Pacific. So there was no longer an urgent need to defend Alaska or a threat of invasion of the American mainland. But the airstrip served by the Alaska Highway for the rest of the war made it possible for almost 8,000 Lend-Lease aircraft from the United States to get to the Russian front through Alaska. It was an incalculable service to the war effort provided by the men who built the highway. And what happened to those men? They said a float plane will be in to pick you up, and one airplane and another ended up back in Louisiana where I organized a unit to go over to Burma to try and build another highway. However, the Japanese occupied the country. It's a lot different than having Charlie McDonald occupying it. Charlie McDonald, the indispensable guide, died in 1975. Many of his descendants, seen here on Al Eshbach's 1942 home movies, still live in the wilderness near Muncho Lake, where McDonald's have hunted and trapped for generations. After the, the uh, roadway had been completed, they said we would come back to the States and we would come to Camp Sutton, North Carolina. This was a great day in my life and every other soldier's life because we knew that we were coming home. Lovely. Back to segregation. <laughs> <laughs> the black soldiers went on to serve with distinction in Normandy, New Guinea, and the Philippines. And for 50 years, their contribution to the Alaska Highway was forgotten, or worse, ignored. When we terminated the road and brought it into Fairbanks, there was no ceremonies. They made like we hadn't done anything. We didn't know we had done anything unusual. Yes. That's how I feel about it. Yes. Well, the four white engineer regiments, those files were complete and accurate and in great detail. Two of the black regiments were so-so. The 97th, the ones that beat the 18th to the border, they had no files. There was nothing in the National Archives about the 97th. It's like they never existed. In 1993, the government tried to make amends for its historical neglect by honoring African-American highway builders in a ceremony at the Pentagon. Hayward Obrey and Nehemiah Atkinson were there. The, the thing that came to my mind, thank God, Hayward, I never thought the day would come, but here the two of us are together being recognized for something that many men probably would never be able to do. Hayward Obrey became an artist after the war. He founded the art department at Alabama State University. Nehemiah Atkinson is a top-ranked senior tennis player. He works with inner-city kids. In 1973, he received the Robert F. Kennedy Ripple of Hope Award. Colonel Heath Twitchell served in Europe and Japan, then retired to write the memoirs that his son turned into Northwest Epic. I never really got to know my father as a kid. He was away during the war. When he came back, I wasn't very interested in his war stories. And after that, I had my own life to lead. And he was getting old, and it was hard to go home. 
And by the time I came to write the book, this was really the only way I had to get to know him. It was an experience that I'll never forget and wouldn't trade for anything. Coming up the Alaska Highway, Heath Twitchell Jr. found his father. 50 years earlier, his father found confidence in himself and in his ability to lead troops. Haywood Obrey found pride here and the value of perseverance. Al Eschbach, who spent his life making the land do what he wanted it to do, found Charlie McDonald, who spent his life doing what the land wanted him to do. They all found something up here, whether it was what they were looking for or not. Besides bulldozers, jeeps, and shovels, and the men who came north to build the highway brought something else with them. They brought a spirit of discovery, a spirit that people are bringing north to this day. We're from Manhattan, Kansas. From Greenville, South Carolina. West Palm Beach, Florida. We got some good patches of road and some bad patches. Tears your rig up pretty good. If everybody drove sensibly, there'd be no problem. But we've enjoyed it. I just think the mountains and lakes are just gorgeous. Beautiful country, all of it. Whatever the source, along the Alaska Highway, that spirit does live on for miles and miles of miles and miles. For Rediscovering America, I'm David Hartman. Thank you.